So I, I, I want to start with uh, talking about police community relations. And I think uh, an interesting place to start uh, is with something I saw this week on the news, uh, a story about uh, a man in southwest Detroit uh, being punched and kicked while on the ground by Detroit police officers in a video. Uh, these kind of things, when they happen, they remind us of the things that still need to be done, I think, to improve police community relations. Uh, but they also remind me of how far yeah. things have, have come over time. I mean, this is a very different city than it used to be. Uh, I want to give you a chance to, to, to put that in context, uh, that, that kind of incident. What does that tell us about police community relations here in Detroit? Well, I'm, I'm glad you started with that question, Stephen. Um, you know, I had a chance to see the video and also had a chance to look at the body-worn cameras of the officers and, and, and read the various reports. So um, without going too far into it, because a young man is facing criminal charges, um, what I can tell you is this, that the snippet that you saw was taken, but it, it, it didn't show the totality. And if you notice, the camera never faced the crowd. It was a crowd of 25 to 30 folks out there. The officers um, were driving, um, patrolling the area. They saw this street party saw an individual in the street, um, the person in question, and um, he had a Patron bottle or some type of liquor bottle in his hand in the street, and um, a pistol was in his shorts with an extended clip. So as a result, they stopped to investigate. Um, he didn't want to comply with their orders. Um, they ordered him to raise his hands. Um, he didn't want to raise his hands because he had on shorts. When he did raise his hands, the pistol fell from his waist to the ground with the extended clip. Um, as they moved in to try to investigate further, um, he wouldn't comply. Other folks in the crowd attempted to stop um, the investigation, and that's what led to um, the use of force. That's what led to other individuals being arrested as well as they tried to interfere. And like I say, force never looks pretty, but he was actively resisting, and um, drugs were also found um, in, a, in, in, in the backpack, book bag, whatever. And um, um, the subject also has a um, criminal record. So I'm pretty sure that, you know, he de definitely did not want to um, engage or um, go to jail, go back to jail dealing with law enforcement. Yeah. And individuals, like I said, at the scene actively, actively um, tried to stop that arrest. So, so I think one of the things that's hard for citizens like me or, or other people who are not police, uh, is to see that kind of conduct by police and, and ever be able to come up with a reason for it happening. I mean, having somebody on the ground and punching and kicking that person, what, why, why is that part of the police repertoire, I think, is, is one of the questions that comes up. I mean, uh, the idea of de-escalating uh, tense situations is what I think we think of when we think of what we have the police for. That seems like the kind of thing that, uh, that makes it worse. So, so what, what I would say is this, that if you saw the entire video and with the body cam, um, which I'm so glad that we have, and as a major department, we're one of the only few departments where all of our officers are equipped with body-worn camera. What that'll show is the totality of everything that occurred. And what you would see then is officers did de-escalate. They did um, give verbal orders which is a form of de-escalation, they had a presence there. But as the crowd and the individuals refused to comply at that point, that's what ups the ante right there. Um, also, punches is a part of um, training as well. It's called hard hands. And when a person is actively resisting to get control, you do get a chance or option to utilize that. Um, also, a taser was used. It was, a, it was, it was an active... Um, scene where he was actively resisting. So um, as soon as officers got him under control, he was quickly handcuffed. And um, that's when the use of force stopped. Uh, so as I said a little earlier, this is a different city than it was when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the relationship between police and the citizens here is very different for a lot of reasons. One of them is uh, the federal consent decree uh, that we had for several years. Uh, in place. I, I wonder what you make of where we are with police community relations in this moment, though, uh, where we see this, this 
uh, continual protest against police brutality and systemic racism uh, and, and increasing uh, conflict uh, clashes between uh, police and, and citizens who are, who are protesting. Is this, uh, is this making that, that whole effort to improve relations more challenging? Look, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's twofold. Um, you know, you have the national narrative, and of course what happens nationally when you see um, instances of um, excessive uses of force, everybody can see it on their cell phone. So it definitely has an impact. It makes you feel a certain way when you view it. And um, folks will have a, a, a general tendency to generalize. But the, but the good thing is, when you have a relationship with your community before something does like that happen, as a result, you have um, um, advocates. And as a result, with our activist community, the advocates, the, the folks that we have built these trusting relationships with, they will actually come um, to the defense of the Detroit Police Department. And during this whole thing that has occurred since the George Floyd incident, um, we've had local activists that have stood with us and have told other individuals that, listen, we don't have those problems here. And why don't you go to a Warren? Why don't you go to a Harper Woods? Why don't you go to a Shelby Township? Why don't you protest there? Because that's where African-Americans in the city of Detroit is having an issue with. You know, just to be bluntly, and I've heard that from the activists that I have relationships with. So um, it's not by accident that we didn't have um, looting, that we didn't have um, burning um, 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 buildings or any other burnt structures. Our community in the city of Detroit stood with the Detroit Police Department, and it's based off that relationship that we have with them to ensure that our city didn't burn. So um, the return on investments for DPD, our relationship under Chief Craig of building those relationships pay dividends for the city of Detroit. Uh, last question. Uh, this has been a really violent summer here uh, and, and lots of people have been affected by that violence. Uh, lots of people have losses uh, because of that, that violence. Um, does that put an additional strain on police community relations and does it put more pressure uh, on the department uh, than, than, than we had before? Does it change, I guess, the narrative around uh, building that trust that, uh, that, that was so important in police community uh, interactions? These are unprecedented times. Um, we have, we, we, we're still in the midst of the COVID pandemic, um, which affected our, 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 our department as well. And, 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 and at the same time, we have um, um, the protests that are going on nationally. And as a result, um, major cities across the country have seen a, a sharp increase. Um, Chicago, um, um, New York, um, and, and um, Seattle, um, Portland, Oregon, they have seen violence surge. And it's other cities that I haven't even named. So Detroit is no exception. But when you think about the pandemic um, in, in February, March, you know, in March, April, we had 700 police officers that were quarantined at one time. So you got to think that's going to have an impact on violent crime. And other cities had issues like that as well. Um, thank God we were able to put things in plan and, and um, um, quickly get to a point where we were able to get our force back, um, back, back um, to low numbers of COVID. But then right on the heels of the pandemic, with, with that, we went right into the, to the George Floyd incident and um, um, daily protests where we would have to deploy sometimes upwards of 200 police officers um, to deal with the large crowds because at, at one point we were seeing crowds of a thousand downtown. So that requires some maneuvering. And as a result, um, you know, it, 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 really, it really requires us to run a lot of overtime to ensure that we backfill and have officers in the neighborhood as well. But these are unprecedented times in our community is under a lot of stress. You know, they even call it like COVID brain. So it's a lot of violence that we're seeing and just a lot of um, folks that are, are suffering from mental illness out there and it exacerbates um, their particular situation. So, yeah. yep, we're, we're, we're under a lot of pressure and I'm not just saying um, as a police department, we all are as a community, but I do believe that we'll get through it together.